What is Modern Monetary Theory, or MMT? Modern Monetary Theory, or MMT, is a description of how the modern fiat-based money system operates with particular emphasis on sovereign governments such as the US, UK, Japan, Australia, Canada and Switzerland, amongst others. And what makes these countries so special is that they are able to produce their own money or currencies through their own central banks, and most importantly, they can never go broke. This is very different from the countries of the Eurozone that cannot produce their own currencies. Eurozone countries use the one currency, the Euro, produced by the European Central Bank, or ECB. Proponents of modern monetary theory assert that the primary policy goals of a sovereign government that can produce its own currency should be full employment and price stability, without which a country cannot operate at its full potential. Modern monetary theory also disputes the commonly accepted view that unemployment is necessary to prevent inflation. Japan, for example, has low unemployment and low inflation. How then, according to modern monetary theory, can full employment and price stability be achieved in countries that can produce their own sovereign currency? It all starts with sales. Essential to the productive growth of the economy or gross domestic product are sales of goods and services. Without being able to sell their products, businesses will stop producing. When they stop producing, they stop hiring and start laying off workers. Unemployment increases and there is a slowdown in the growth of the GDP. To be able to buy and sell things and help the economy grow, there needs to be an adequate supply and turnover of money into the hands of people who are prepared to spend it. The amount of money supply in a country to foster productive growth should also therefore take into account the natural desire for people to save, the need to pay off private debts such as house mortgages, credit cards and student loans, and money being concentrated in the hands of a wealthy few who hoard rather than spending it back into the economy. Each of these behaviours reduces the supply of money that can be used to generate sales. Given that an adequate money supply is required to generate sales, what actually is money? How does it get its value? Where does it come from? And how do people acquire it? Modern monetary theory tells us that money gets its value in a sovereign country because it is the only thing you can pay your taxes with. In Australia, for example, you can only pay your taxes with Australian dollars. This means that people need to acquire Australian dollars somehow to pay their taxes. For money to exist, it has to be produced by a country's central bank, such as the Fed in the US, the Bank of England in the UK, or the Reserve Bank in Australia. And this can be in the form of banknotes or just keystrokes on a computer. To understand how money created by the government is brought into circulation, we need to understand the nature of the two sectors of the economy. The government sector, which in a country that can produce its own sovereign currency is not financially constrained, and it does not have to collect money before it can spend, and the private sector, of which there are two parts. The private domestic sector, of firms and individuals consuming locally produced goods and services bought and sold within the country, and the private foreign sector, which exports and imports goods and services to and from other countries. Unlike the government sector, the private sector is financially constrained. It must have money before it can spend. And money is brought into circulation when the government finances government services such as welfare payments and social service payments, military spending, education, health, public order and the environment. And when the government buys goods and services directly from the private sector. And this might include, for example, contracting out firms in the private sector to build infrastructure programs such as dams, roads and bridges. The fact that the government sector can produce its own money allows it to buy anything for sale from the private sector in its own currency without ever going broke. It can never become insolvent. Most importantly, it can spend first without having to collect taxes. The private sector, on the other hand, cannot produce its own money. To get money, the private sector has to either get it from government or through exports to another country. 
To further understand the relationship between the government sector and the private sector, we need to consider how they relate to the budget. When the amount of money the government sector collects in taxes is exactly equal to the amount it spends, the government is said to be running a balanced budget. If the government spends more than it collects in taxes, it is said to be running a deficit budget. And when it collects more in taxes than it spends, it is running a surplus budget. This means that when the government is running a surplus, the private sector is running a deficit. And conversely, when the government is running a deficit, the private sector is running a surplus. When viewed on a chart, this relationship appears like a mirror image. And given then that it's virtually impossible to have a balanced budget, what then is preferable, a government deficit or a public sector deficit? Proponents of modern monetary theory would argue the government should run a deficit and create enough money until there is a state of full employment to generate spending and subsequent growth in the GDP. Indeed, it is normal for governments to run deficit budgets and have done consistently for many years with few exceptions. The alternative to running a government deficit is to strive for a government surplus and by necessity a private sector deficit unless a country has a positive trade balance where it exports more than it imports. The US, UK, Australia and Canada however all import more than they export. So to run a government surplus they'd need to introduce austerity measures by reducing public services or taxing the private sector more. To pay for this the private sector would need to cut into private savings, sell assets or take out loans on credit, thus increasing private sector debt which is already running at extremely high levels in relation to GDP. However, in taking money out of the private sector to reduce government debt, there is less money to spend into the economy leading to a slowdown in growth, the very opposite of what is required. Despite this obvious contradiction, most politicians and economic commentators fear that if the government deficit grows too large, future generations will be burdened with a debt that can never be repaid. This attitude fails to recognise, however, that the government can never go broke. As the issuer of its own currency, the government can always pay its debts. This was not the case prior to 1971 when countries were on the gold standard and the value of money was backed by gold. However, following the adoption of the fiat money system, when countries were able to float their own currencies, the requirements of the gold standard no longer applied. It must be understood that the budget of a government that can produce its own sovereign currency and spend without having first to collect taxes is very different from what we might intuitively believe a budget should be, based on our knowledge of an everyday household budget where you must have money before you can spend. It does however beg the question that if a government that can produce its own currency can spend without having to collect taxes, what is the purpose of collecting taxes in the first place? Taxes are used to combat inflation and maintain price stability. If there's too much money in the economy, which might cause inflation, taxes can be used to remove money from the economy. Think of the economy as a large bird bath. We are trying to maintain a level of water so there's enough water for birds to stand up and splash around in. But you don't want too much water because it'll be difficult for small birds. Now some days it will rain quite heavily to the point where the bird bath will overflow and you'll have to empty some water out of the bird bath. Sometimes it will not rain for days and the water will get so low the birds won't be able to splash around at all. In such cases you have to add water. Let's equate the bird bath with the private economy. To keep the amount of money at a level for the private economy to function effectively and maintain price control, the government might need to take money out of the private economy. It does this with taxes. Private savings that people don't spend and imports also take money out of the private economy. Alternatively, to ensure there is an adequate supply of money in the economy, the government may have to add money with more government spending. Private investment and exports also add money to the private economy. Taxes then are like a regulator that the government uses to take money out of the private sector to ensure price stability and prevent excess inflation. To recap, modern monetary theory tells us that unless a country is running a trade surplus with more exports than imports, it will be necessary for the government to run a deficit to ensure there is enough money in the economy for growth in the GDP 
and to achieve the goals of full employment and price stability. So how can full employment be achieved? The major policy measure followers of modern monetary theory advocate in pursuit of full employment is a job guarantee program where the government offers anyone who is out of work a secure job on the minimum wage as a transitional measure to give them both an adequate source of income and job readiness for a move into employment in the private sector should a position become available. The jobs should also ideally include normal workers benefits such as sick leave, superannuation and holiday pay. And this provides a pool of work ready employees that enable the economy to function at its full potential. It also provides a measure of how large a government deficit should be. The government deficit should be as large as it takes to employ the last person looking for work. Job guarantee jobs should not compete with positions in the private sector but might include such things as full-time family and community care, assistance to pensioners and the incapacitated and various environmental schemes such as land reclamation and urban renewal projects. Under the job guarantee model there is a buffer stock of workers that can provide an alternative to the current natural rate of unemployment known as Nauru, used by governments to prevent inflation. If inflation does get too high, pressure can be reduced by transferring labour from the private sector to the buffer stock. This way labour remains job ready and not left idle and unemployed as it is under the Nehru model. The job guarantee program should not only be viewed from an economic perspective. The social consequences of unemployment include poverty, crime, social isolation, depression, despair, relationship and family breakdowns and social and political instability. It has also been shown that the longer a person remains unemployed the higher the chances they'll become unemployable. As a description of the modern economy and a prescription to fully employ people looking for work, modern monetary theory remains on the outskirts of the mainstream economic and political thinking. Currently in most countries, returning government budgets to surplus with austerity programs and cuts in government spending is in political favour. Modern monetary theory offers a real alternative to this view. Only time will tell, however, if it ever becomes mainstream.